So shout it's gonna be. It's gonna be. It's up to me. It's up to me. So I told you the other night, too many times Christians ask God to do what he gave us the power to do. All right, we, we need to stop asking that God to do what we have the ability to do. The disciples went to Jesus and said, Lord, how, how are you going to feed these 5,000 people? And Jesus said, I'm not going to do it. You do it. Amen? God gave you the empowerment. God gave you the, the ability. Uh, I told you the other night, we need to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. If you only listen to the word without doing it, you quickly forget how the word works. That's what that scripture says. It says you walk away. It's like a person who forgot what they look like in a mirror. If you're a doer of the word, it's much harder to forget how it works because you've experienced the word in operation. When you're not just reading the word, when you're not just listening to the word, when you're actually putting the word into operation, it's a lot harder for you to forget how the word works because you've experienced it and you've got the results. Amen? Amen. A person who is a hearer and not a doer the Bible says, deceives themselves. Why do they deceive themselves? Because they think they have faith, but they really don't. All they have is knowledge. Faith is not knowledge. Faith is not mere belief. Faith is action. Faith is not just knowing the word. Faith is not just believing the word. Faith is putting the word to work. The Bible says you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, right? But the verse before that says that in order to know the truth, you have to be operating in the Word. You don't really know it when all you've done is you've heard it. You don't really know it when you've just read it. You know it when you're doing it. You know it when you're putting it into action. That's what that uh, uh, phrase in, I, th I think it's uh, John chapter 8, uh, I believe it's 31 and 32. Verse 32 says, you'll know the truth. It actually says, then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, what is then? Then is after verse 31, which says, you need to abide in his word, obeying it and continually operating in it. That's how you're going to know the word, is by operating in the word. Too many Christians are just sitting around getting fat on the word. They're soaking up teaching, they're soaking up revelation, but they're not doing anything with it. And that's a really, really easy way to get spiritually unbalanced, by the way. I told you the other night, at some point, we need to get off the spiritual couch and put the word to work somewhere in our lives. And some of us need to get off the physical couch and do the same thing. Amen? I told you this the other night, it makes no difference what you believe if you're not putting that belief to work. Faith without works is dead. God gave you the keys to the kingdom. Amen? Amen? So unlock it. Unlock the kingdom. People have a huge key ring of kingdom keys, but they're not using them. I told you the other night, the kingdom is in your hand. It's not under your seat. So stop sitting on it. Take that kingdom that's in your hand and put it to work. Somebody say amen. amen. So let me ask you a question tonight. What is better? Is it better to be a person who has a knowledge of how to do something or to be a person who has experience putting that knowledge to work? Would you rather have a surgeon who is fresh out of medical school and has all the head knowledge or would you rather have a surgeon has, who has years of experience under his belt? Yeah. Now, both surgeons have the same number of years of college education, right? Both surgeons have the book knowledge, they have the head knowledge, but only one has actually put that knowledge to practical use. One is a hearer, the other one is a doer. A doer is better, amen? Uh, when you're learning how to fly, they have a thing called ground school, where you, you, know, you sit in a classroom and you talk with an instructor and they tell you all about what the gauges do and uh, how aerodynamics work and how the engine works and how lift works and they talk about airspace and regulations and weather and all of that stuff and they just pump you full of knowledge but there's no substitute for getting in the airplane and actually flying it. Amen? We need to graduate to getting out of ground school and actually getting behind the controls and putting that knowledge to, to, to use. All right? 1 Corinthians tells us that we need to earnestly desire spiritual gifts, right? 
That means you should be earnestly desiring in how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Because it applies to all of us, right? All right. Too many times Christians sit and they stand in awe watching other people operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And it's, it's nice to watch other people operate in the gifts of the Spirit, but there are giftings that God wants to, to do through you. There are things that God wants to accomplish through you. Earnestly desire spiritually gifts. You should be earnestly desiring how to operate in the things of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are for the whole body. That includes you. Amen? Yes. Learning how to flow in the Spirit is a learned behavior. How do you learn? You learn by actually doing it. At some point, you're going to have to step out in faith and allow God to use you. And it may be the simplest thing. It may be the smallest thing. Well, maybe it's small to you, but maybe it's huge to somebody else. I mean, you could say three words under the unction of the Holy Spirit and they could transform somebody's life. But guess what won't transform somebody's life? Not, yeah, doing nothing. So, now, there's a principle that I want to teach you tonight, a, a really powerful kingdom principle. But before I get to that kingdom principle, I need to lay a really good foundation. Okay? So we're going to go through quite a few scriptures tonight. Uh, I want to talk to you about the subject of grace, God's grace, okay? So first of all, I want to uh, share with you uh, the way grace has been defined by a lot of people. Um, how many have heard grace defined as unmerited favor? Anybody ever heard that, that, that definition before? In fact, um, grace is defined as unmerited favor several times in the Amplified Bible, uh, I've heard some people define grace as graciousness. God's grace is his graciousness. I've heard people define it that way. I've heard people define grace pretty much equivalent to mercy. Because we always use the phrase mercy and grace. God's grace and mercy. In fact, there's even songs that talk about mercy and grace or grace and mercy. But how many know there's a difference between mercy and grace? Okay, if there wasn't a difference, then they wouldn't have two different words. Mercy is one thing, grace is another thing. So grace is not the same as mercy. Well, I'm going to show you here in a, in a moment. I think that the definition of grace, to define it as favor, that's kind of a good definition, but I think there's a more powerful interpretation of what grace really is. And to define grace as God's graciousness, again, I... I understand where people are coming from when they say it that way, but I really think there is a more uh, powerful application of what grace really is. Uh, how many have ever heard somebody use the phrase, I've been graced to do something? You know, you, you go up to somebody and say, uh, hey, um, we need you to help, uh, you know, volunteer in church in the children's ministry. And they'll say, oh, I'm not graced for that. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm not, that's not my grace, okay? So grace, I really believe, is, is more tied into an empowerment to do something, an ability to do something, all right? So I'm going to show you uh, some, uh, some patterns here in Scripture. Let's go to Acts chapter 4, verse 33. It says this, this is in the NIV version, with great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Okay? Now, when you look at this, you're looking at God's grace being at work. I, I don't really think that applies so much to favor or to graciousness as it actually does to an empowerment of ability. With great power, the, the apostles continued to testify. They were using God's power to do something. They were using God's power to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And not only that, God's grace was powerfully at work. So, so here we see that grace is an empowerment to do work. All right? 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18 says this, You already know these things, dear friends, so be on guard... 
then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Next verse. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Growing in grace will help you to be on guard and to not lose your, your spiritual footing. Well, how do you grow in grace if grace is simply just a bestowment of favor? As I've heard it defined so many times, grace is favor. How do you grow in that grace if grace is just a gift of favor? You grow in grace by learning how to operate in the grace given to you. You, go, you grow in grace by putting it to work. Grace is an empowerment to do something. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says this. Timothy, this is Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. So grace strengthens you. Grace makes you strong. Grace gives you an empowerment. Okay? Grace is not just a gift of favor. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 says, God's grace abounds to you. God is, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Are, are you seeing this, this pattern here that grace is tied to work? Grace is tied to an empowerment? Grace is, is, is tied to ability? God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Now, by the way, this scripture is actually talking about uh, the, the Corinthian church was getting ready to take an offering, a financial offering to go to another church. And Paul said that if you participate in this offering, God is going to make all grace, his ability, his empowerment, all grace is going to abound towards you that you, always having sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. The uh, NIV version says, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. That's, that's God's design for your finances, by the way. You'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. But God's grace is abounding. God's grace abounds to you so that you can help others. Again, I don't see this word grace being so much an endowment of favor as it is an endowment of power, an endowment of empowerment, enabling, giving you ability. It's, it's God gives you his grace to do the work. Amen? Amen. First Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7 says this. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. So again, he's talking about grace doing something. In, in this case, it's using the grace of God to receive knowledge, to operate in spiritual gifting, and to operate in spiritual empowerment. Over and over and over again, we're seeing that grace is an empowerment. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ has apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What are those gifts? His spiritual gifts. That's what his grace is. Next verse. But what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? Next verse. He, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Next verse. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Okay? His grace, you know, we always talk about the five-fold ministry, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, but what he's talking about in this passage is grace. He, he graced 
apostles. He graced prophets. He graced evangelists. He graced pastors and teachers. Why did he grace them? To equip them, to equip his people for works of service. Grace is to do the work of the ministry. Grace is an empowerment. How did all those ministry offices come into being? When Jesus gave us a portion of his grace. All right? Are you following with me? This is going to get really good in a second, I promise you. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Again, grace is, is tied to gifting. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. Next verse. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Okay, so what are we seeing here? Grace, again, is used for service. It's used to serve, it's used to teach, it's used to encourage, it's used to give. Grace is God's empowerment. So everyone just say this, grace, grace. is God's empowerment. Grace is God's ability. All right, good. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11 says this. Each of you should use whatever gift you have, whatever gift you have received, to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. Again, speaking, serving, doing something. That's what God's grace is for, for you to do something, for you to accomplish something in the kingdom. It's not just a bestowment of favor. It's not just a bestowment of graciousness. It's actually an empowerment to do works of service. Give me the last part of that verse. Yeah, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So the grace of God is the empowerment of God. Uh, the, in, in this verse, it said, or in this version, it said grace in its various forms. The King James Version says the manifold grace of God. You've read that before. Manifold means many fold. God's grace comes in many different forms. It's a many fold type of grace. But all, all of those different forms are forms of empowerment to do things for the kingdom. God's grace manifests in many different forms, but they are all with the purpose of serving others, of doing something for the kingdom. Now, how does that idea really apply to favor or graciousness? Again, I think, I understand it when people say that grace is God's favor, when, the, when they say that grace is God's graciousness, but I think that's kind of a weak definition. What grace really is, is God's empowerment, God's ability flowing through you, something that enables you to do something. So can we all agree through what we just read over and over and over again, the Bible talks about grace as empowerment to do something. Can we see that? Not just an endowment, not just a gift of favor. The Bible talks about great grace, great power, growing in grace, being strong in grace. Okay, that's not just a gift of favor. That's God giving you power to do something. So I often say it like this, to just simply define it, I like to say grace is God's ability. God's ability flowing through you, that's his grace, all right? It's his ability infused into us to carry out the work of the ministry, to serve others, and to further the kingdom. So with that in mind, we go to Ephesians chapter 2, we know this verse very well. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For by grace, God's ability, by God's ability you have been saved through your faith. But your faith is even, it's not even of yourselves, it's, it is a gift of God. God gave you the faith to receive his grace. His grace is his ability, his grace is his empowerment. It is by his ability that, you, that, he, that you've been saved. It's not through your ability. It's not what you can do, it's what he did. His ability, for by God's ability have you been saved through your faith 
And this faith is not even of yourselves either. It's a gift of God, not of works so that no one can boast. So you can't even boast in the faith that you exercised in order to receive your salvation because you didn't give yourself that faith. God did. All right, so grace is empowerment. Grace is not just favor. Grace is a specific gifting that is placed upon us. You don't have the ability in and of yourself, but God has given you the ability. That ability is there to enable you to do what you cannot do in your own strength. I'm going to say that again. God gave you grace to give you ability to do things that you cannot do in your own strength. There was a, uh, a survey that was done, I think around five years ago or so. And they surveyed 2,000 Christians. And in that survey, one of the things they asked these 2,000 Christians to do they said, uh, define what grace is. And out of 2,000 Christians, only about 4% of them defined grace as an empowerment or an ability to do something. Most of them defined grace as favor or as graciousness or something else or as mercy or forgiveness. Uh, but only 4% of Christians defined grace as God's empowerment. But we just saw here in the word over and over and over again, grace is always tied to doing something. It's tied to empowering you with God's ability. Okay? So, with all of that in mind, now that I've laid the foundation, I want to get to the, to the good stuff. I want to share with you a really popular passage of scripture that is probably one of the most misunderstood passages in scripture. And remember, we're still talking about if, if it's going to be, it's up to me. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 2 through 4 and 7 through 9. Paul says this. <clears throat> I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for man to utter. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Notice he says that twice in this verse lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, the first thing I want to say is, uh, in verse uh, two, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago went to heaven. How many know Paul's talking about himself? Okay. He, he, I think he's trying to be humble, and he's, he's, speaking to him, he's speaking about himself in the third person. But we find out that Paul was the one that went to heaven. He, he says, I don't know if I went to heaven in the body or out of the body. All I know is that I went to heaven, and I heard some amazing things while I was in heaven. And I got a lot of revelation while I was in heaven. And then in verse 7, he says, And lest I be exalted above measure... A thorn in the flesh was given to me. Now, I have heard it taught this way many, many times, and by show of hands, how many have been taught, or have heard it taught, that what Paul was saying here was, lest I become lifted up in pride, lest I become exalted above measure. I've heard this taught many times. Paul's saying, uh, this is the way I've heard it taught, so that I wouldn't become lifted up, so that I wouldn't become puffed up, so that I wouldn't become prideful, exalted above measure, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And so a lot of people have taught that what happened here is that God was trying to keep Paul humble, so God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh. Well, we know that the thorn in the flesh couldn't have come from God because it says right there, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. So does God send messengers of Satan? No. 
Who sends messengers of Satan? Satan. 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 Yeah, it's not rocket surgery. Okay. <clears throat> so, lest I become exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So this phrase, exalted above measure, would Satan care if Paul became lifted up in pride? He, he would like that, wouldn't he? He would want him to be prideful. He wants him to be puffed up. Okay. This word, this phrase, exalted above measure, if you look it up in the Greek, what it means is promoted. Lifted up. Promoted. And lest I be promoted by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be promoted. What Paul is saying is, I went to heaven and I received these really powerful revelations and Satan was aware of this and he didn't want my ministry to grow because of this. He didn't want me to become promoted. He didn't want me to grow in influence. He didn't want my, uh, my fame to be spread abroad, so he sent a thorn in the flesh to keep me from becoming promoted, to, to hinder me, to keep me from, being, uh, uh, from growing in my influence. This is what was happening. Now, a lot of people have also taught that Paul's thorn in the flesh was sickness. Okay, if you look up the phrase thorn or thorn in the flesh or thorn in the side or thorn in the eye, that phrase is found, I think, four different times in Scripture. Only once in the New Testament. Every other time it's, it's mentioned in the Old Testament. And every time that it's mentioned, it's talking about people who are a nuisance. It's not talking about sickness. You're going to get a thorn in the side. You're going to get a thorn in the eye. It's somebody who is just an annoyance to you. Something that's, that's, that's a distraction. Something that is a nuisance. Okay? So, Paul's thorn in the flesh was not sickness. It was some sort of a personality that was an annoying nuisance. That was a distraction and a hindrance to Paul. And it was given to him to keep the word from going out. Do you see that? Okay, I received all of these powerful revelations when I went to heaven and Satan knew that if I began to preach this, I was going to get famous. My, I was going to get promoted. People were going to know who Paul was. And so Satan sent a distraction to keep my ministry from fulfilling its potential. Okay, now here's the good part. Verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I had a person in my office one day. They said, Pastor Heath, I'm going through a really bad uh, situation right now, and I just don't know what to do about it. I, you know, I, I think God has given me the same answer that he gave Paul, because this thing is really uh, uh, just... It's a terrible situation that I'm going through, and I've asked God uh, to remove it, and God said no, just like he said no to Paul. Did God say no to Paul anywhere in this verse? No. No. He says, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, and God said, my grace is sufficient for you. What is his grace? Empowerment. It's his empowerment. It's his, it's his ability. It's his enabling. If it's going to be, it's, it's up to me. Amen? Concerning this thing, I asked the Lord three times to take this thing away from me. And God said, I gave you my empowerment. My empowerment is sufficient for, sufficient for you. Don't ask me to take this thing away. I gave you the authority to do it. I gave you the empowerment to do it. I gave you my anointing. I gave you my word. My kingdom is on the inside of you. You have everything that you need in order to take care of this thing. My grace is sufficient for you. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. Why is that? Because if there's no weakness, there's no opportunity for me to show myself strong through you. Wow. Amen? Amen? If it's going to be, it's up to me. 
Too many times we're asking God to take things out of our life and God's saying, I gave you the authority. Don't ask me to do it. My grace is sufficient for you. My ability is sufficient for you. In other words, Paul, you removed this thorn in the flesh. I gave you the keys to the kingdom. I put my kingdom on the inside of you. I gave you my ability. I gave you my empowerment and it is sufficient. So put it to work. Amen. Paul, if you'll put my strength to work in your weakness, my strength will be made perfect. But how can my strength operate to a state of perfection if you're not applying it towards your weakness? Amen. Stop asking me to remove this thing, Paul. You do it. Use my strength. Just shout it again. If it's going to be, it's up to me. Now look, folks, that's not sacrilegious. That's not disrespectful to God. That means that you have enough faith to believe that God loves you, that he has empowered you, that he has enabled you, and that his spirit, his anointing, and his grace are sufficient to the task, no matter what you're facing. Faith without works is dead. If you, want to, if you believe God wants you free, then you need to exercise your faith by taking authority over the thorns that Satan sends your way. Take authority over it. You have the ability you have the empowerment. You have been graced. Throw your hands in the air and say, I've been graced. I've been graced. Satan would love nothing more than to keep you and your ministry from accomplishing anything significant for the kingdom. But you have the authority to trample on the devil. Yeah. Shout it again. I have his grace. I have his, grace. I have his empowerment. I have his, I have his ability. I have his and it is sufficient. It is, sufficient. It is more than enough. More than enough. I can apply it. To my weakness, and there it will be made perfect. Now fist bump three people and tell them, I've got it and so do you. Amen. Shout it one more time. If it's going to be, it's up to me. Well, give God praise for it if you believe it. Hallelujah. You've got the ability. You've got the empowerment. You've got his word. You've got his anointing. What more do you need? Amen. You've got it all. Just put it to work. All right. That, I mean, how many times have we heard people teach this story and they say, well, you know, sometimes we go through stuff and God's grace is sufficient. It'll, it'll get me through. No, it's not sufficient to make you endure it. It's sufficient to take the thing out of your life. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Well, I'm done. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Heath Jarvis from Faith Life Worship Center, and I hope that you really enjoyed the message that you just saw. And if you like this message, check out our other videos, and be sure to subscribe to our channel. Go to faithlifeworshipcenter.com where you can learn all about our church, our service times, and everything that's going on, and we would love to see you really soon at Faith Life Worship Center.